My name is John Alexander. I'm head of school here at Groves. Um, before we get started, I just want to get an idea of who you are. How many are here primarily as parents? Okay, and then how many are teachers? And any administrators? Good. Um, yeah, because I have some biases that uh, we'll talk about later that maybe administrators, actually some of the teachers, you, you, you may disagree too, but that's okay. It's okay to disagree. Um, before we launch into this, uh, just want to ask you, what do you think, and you probably have already thumbed through the handout, but what are the cr most critical uh, grades for us to teach reading? Do you think? Where is it really... We have to make the biggest impact early. early, yeah. From kindergarten through third grade, really, are the critical years, the watershed years. Um, because once we hit fourth grade, there's a real conscious decision uh, in schools to move from learning to read to reading to learn. So if you haven't mastered reading yet by the end of third grade, uh, you really start to fall behind quickly in school because. Now you're introduced to social studies textbooks, science textbook, new math textbooks with word problems. And that gap uh, that exists, that reading gap, just grows each year subsequent after third grade. So we know too through many independent studies uh, funded by the National Institute, Institutes of Health that if we don't identify students who are struggling with reading, uh, whether they're neurologically miswired or they're instructional casualties, if we don't identify them by the end of third grade and provide proper forms of intervention, there's only a 25% chance that they're going to catch up in their school careers. So that's a really an alarming statistic, I think. Um, and it p points to, the, to me the importance of identifying these kids in the early grades if they're not reading at grade level. Unfortunately, in the way we identify kids with a reading problem now is through a discrepancy model, so that a student, you know, has to test. There are two parts of the, the testing that a student gets to determine whether he qualifies for services. One is potential, which is the IQ test, and the other is achievement testing in reading and math and spelling and written language and so forth. And if a certain discrepancy exists, about two standard deviations from um, grade level or from potential level, um, then that student qualifies and can get services. Now the problem with that is it takes time for that gap to have grown to two standard deviations. So it's very hard to show uh, in kindergarten, first and second grade, and even third, that that discrepancy has grown big enough for that child to qualify for services. So it's a really a, a, a model doomed for failure in terms of identifying and helping kids with a reading problem. Later in this presentation, we'll, we'll look at a different model uh, that can identify kids much sooner and is part of a uh, a literacy platform that I propose uh, that we use as a state that might allow us not to go to the extremes that Florida has gone in instituting reading reform. Okay, so again, keep in mind the importance of third grade and some other statistics that go around that. Um, Eighty, about 89 percent of kids who drop out of high school struggled with reading in third grade. Okay, so it's a real strong predictor of dropout rates. Conversely, about the same percentage, about 88% of students from poverty who read at grade level in third grade graduate from high school on time. So again, third grade reading becomes a, a very powerful predictor of future academic success. And if you have any questions or comments during this presentation, please speak out. Don't save it for the end. So a lot of the information in the first half of the, of the slideshow 
um, comes from this really nice position paper called Preparing All Minnesota Children to Read by Third Grade, put out by the American, American Experiment, Center of the American Experiment here in Minneapolis. Uh, they have a good website, uh, and I think these are all free. I don't, unfortunately, I, we had about 100 of them, and this is the last copy here. But you could go to the website and, uh, and order your own. But a lot of the information comes, at least in the first half of the presentation, comes from this. And the, the sources are cited for these statistics in this paper. So again, I talked about the importance of third grade. Um, and the many, many different replicated studies funded by the National Institute of Health talking about the importance of identifying and intervening with kids by the end of third grade if they're going to get back on track. Um, kids who don't read proficiently by third grade are four times as likely to drop out of high school than proficient readers. And I talked about the 88% who are dropouts who struggle with reading in third grade, comprise 88% of high school dropouts. Yet on the other hand, uh, kids who are reading, f kids who are in poverty but are reading at grade level by the end of third grade graduate from high school, the large percentage of them. Okay, as of 2010, on uh, National Association of Education Progress, NAEP testing, uh, in Minneapolis, 65% of black fourth graders were not reading at grade level, and approximately 40% scored at the lowest level and effectively couldn't read at all. 51% of Hispanic fourth graders could not read at grade level, and 21% of white fourth graders scored below grade level in reading. And we know that kids who enter fourth grade without mastering basic literacy skills fall farther and farther behind in every subject with every passing year. So that gap, achievement gap, grows larger and larger uh, as time goes on. Minnesota happens to be the uh, state in the nation with the widest achievement gap between those who can read and those who can't. So greater than Mississippi, and Alabama, and Georgia, you know, states that historically have had large achievement gaps. We have, um, throughout the country, uh, really socially promote kids through the grades, even if they can't read. One of the distinguishing uh, characteristics of the Florida reform movement uh, was that they ended social pr promotion. And, and we'll look at the results of that I was called, uh, we'll look at the results of, of Florida in a minute. I was called at the beginning of the last legislative session and asked to testify uh, at state hearings uh, to end social promotion. And it really, uh, when I got the call and listened to the senator who was asking me to testify, uh, it really caused me to reflect because my initial response was, I can't do that. I can't. Uh, I can't support that because of the implication of stigma and esteem and on and on of the affected child who's held back. Since that time, since you know maybe eight or nine months ago, I'm starting to come around to a, maybe a different position um, and, and that maybe holding kids back might be an appropriate thing to do. And certainly in Florida, I think they did it for the right reasons and they have very good results because of how they've handled it. M my view today is that I, I don't think we have to go that far. I think that we can implement a literacy framework in this state that w wouldn't require holding kids back in third grade. And we'll talk about what that literacy framework might look like. And you know, there's, uh, it creates a lot of anxiety. The thought of holding a student back really can make parents and students anxious um, about damaging self-esteem. And that's probably the, the biggest reason not to do it. Uh, in addition, you know, it doesn't make any sense at all to hold a, a student back and keep them in a system that hasn't worked through third grade. 
So uh, 